had your drink. Now, I want I you know, to. I know. Free. Now, while you may think that if the policeman thought he would reanimate, I mean, after all, it is a cartoon. The reality is, for humans and many species, freezing is lethal. The formation of ice crystals within a cell can rupture the cell membrane, destroying the cell's function and tissue integrity. So why are people interested in freezing as a way of life preservation? Well, it is super cool for two reasons. It is, well, super cool in terms of temperature, and cool for the ingenious ways researchers have found to alleviate ice crystal formation, which has many potential applications. This is the field of cryobiology and cryopreservation. So in this video, we will have a beginner's intro to cryobiology, and also a bit into cryogenics. The why, the what, the hmm, the how, the what if, and the potential. So firstly, what is the motivation for why we need cryobiology? Now, while you might initially think of something like cryogenics, the preservation of human bodies, cryopreservation more generally refers to the process of storing materials at sub temperatures with minimal loss in function, and it's already used in many applications, but could do with some improvements. Firstly, one of the motivations is for organ transplants. You're probably well aware that there is currently a huge shortage for organs, with around 17 people in the US dying every day waiting for a transplant, and this number is only expected to grow as the population increases and gets older. Cryopreservation is also important for storing cells, like oocytes and sperm, which can be used to preserve one's fertility. And similarly for scientific research, our scientists like to grow cells and use tissue samples, and we can't do everything everywhere all at once. We routinely freeze our samples so that we can use them at later time points, when we have time. <laughs> Moreover, we can order cells from so-called cell banks, and there are also seed banks. Millions of seeds are being frozen in Norway as a source of future food and crop security. There are also cell-based therapies, such as immunotherapies that are being investigated, that also need to be stored. And then lastly, as we'll discuss near the end of this video, there's cryogenics. The ability to preserve human bodies when there is currently no cure to the cause of death, so that they can be thawed when we do have a cure for their cause of death. Or, as seen in many fiction films, there is the idea of using cryopreservation, or cryosleep, for long duration space travel. So that's the motivation, but there are some challenges. You see, when I decide to thaw some cells, not all of them survive the process, and that's not my fault, well, maybe to some extent it is, but that's just because the way we freeze it and the way we thaw them isn't 100% effective. So why does that happen? Well, as we lower the temperature, the water outside the cell starts to freeze. As that starts to freeze, it reduces the water concentration and increases the concentration of solutes. This then draws extra water out of the cell through osmosis, causing the cell to become dehydrated. Crystals may also form inside the cell. And so to circumvent this, we use so-called cryoprotective agents. Two standard cryoprotective agents that are used are DMSO and glycerol, with DMSO famously being used for storing skin. But it's not just about the use of cryoprotective agents, it's also about the speed of the cooling, how fast is it, as different cell types have different optimal thresholds. The whole rationale behind cryoprotective agents is to prevent ice crystals from forming, and one way of doing that is through vitrification, the process of changing a liquid into a hard substance that doesn't contain crystals. Here this works by adding a high concentration of cryoprotectants and ice blockers to water and cooling the sample really fast, so fast it becomes a glass. So job done? Well, not really. While these cryoprotectants and cooling strategies have some efficacy, there is firstly the problem with freezing beyond cells, such as organs, where you have different cell types, different sizes, and so it's hard to freeze all parts evenly. And in these cases, with organs, sometimes you can't really afford to lose that many cells, unlike me trying to freeze a file of cells that are all identical, where I could, you know, I could lose a few because I'll get some back. Which brings us on to the second sort of major problem, which is the fact that it's not just about freezing the samples, it's also about warming the samples back up again. Because during warming, ice recrystallization can occur, where ice crystals can grow and cause mechanical damage and cell lysis. 
So how can we improve this process to minimise the damage on both the rapid cooling and the thawing? Well, one location where we can get some lessons, potentially, is from looking at model organisms. You see, model organisms, or well, just other organisms that aren't ourselves, deal with the cold in different ways. Option number one, migrate to warmer places. A bit chill, or the nippy era. I'm just saying, how do we know it's an ice age? Because of all the ice? Well, things just got a little chillier. Probably not that useful in this case. Two, anhydrobiosis, drying out. Nice. Potentially not that effective when it comes to cryogenics. Three, freeze avoidance strategies or extracellular freeze tolerance strategies, like this wood frog here. It can endure freezing of up to 70% of its total body water in winter months and thaw within hours without experiencing any measurable change. When frozen, the wood frogs show no cardiac or lung activity, brain function or physical movement, but all of these capabilities are restored upon thawing. Sounds like we should be investigating the wood frog. So how much wood would the wood frog frog if a wood frog could frog wood? Well, there is some research that's been done into these wood frogs, and one way that they prepare is that they increase the amount of glycogen storage in late fall to serve as an internal fuel during freezing, and they modify their membrane structure to prevent cellular collapse, inducing a strong antioxidant response to combat oxidative damage, and most importantly, they reduce their overall metabolism to strategically utilise the stored energy only for pro-survival processes. The question still is, well, how do they trigger it? How do they get it all regulated? But they're not the only species we can look at. We can also look at the ladybugs. It super cools without freezing. Water in the ladybug remains liquid at minus 19 degrees, apparently. The way they do it is by making antifreeze chemicals or ice blockers. So potentially nature already has answers that we can exploit to be able to improve our cryopreservation strategies. For example, one species definitely worth further investigating are the arctic squirrels. They are the largest animals known to supercool. And the reason that, obviously, large animals it's harder to supercool is the fact that one thing you want to do is prevent ice crystals from forming and ice crystals can form in the presence of so-called nucleators that help all the water molecules line up. So these are things like bits of dust, bits of foods and bacteria, which obviously the bigger you are, the more nucleators you have about. So yeah, that's a bit of a problem. But this also links on to hibernation, which the Arctic squirrels also undergo, where hibernation triggers the slowdown of the metabolism But not only should we be investigating then how these different species hibernate or what triggers their slowing down of metabolism, but we also should probably work out what makes the hibernating animals wake up. But another interesting thing to think about is what happens following the hibernation or this period of cooling. And one thing that people were intrigued about was whether or not the Arctic ground squirrels retains their long-term memory after this hibernation. Because during hibernation, blood flow to the brain and metabolism is greatly reduced. And there are also changes to the length and branching of the dendrites. While so far the data suggests that there is an impact, there is some evidence that it reduced their recall and a maze navigation task compared to squirrels that didn't hibernate. But it didn't affect their ability to discriminate familiar from unfamiliar individuals. But this is hibernation... A study came out in 2015 that showed persistence of long-term memory in vitrified and revived worms. Although that said, this opposing review writes, the results of this study on nematode worms are a far cry from providing any evidence that human memory can be preserved post-vitrification. And to be fair, I think I agree with this so far. There really does seem to be a lack of evidence. So what else is going on in the space at the moment? Well, in 2015... The brain of a small rabbit was frozen, and it was recovered in near-perfect condition. And according to a press release, it is the first demonstration that near-perfect, long-term structural preservation of an intact mammalian brain is achievable. But preservation of the brain, again, in no way indicates that all psychological functions remain intact. So ultimately, I think until we have an agreement on the molecular entity structure, slash phenomenon of what memory storage and brain function really is, I don't think it is easy to infer whether memory would be preserved. So that's what's going on in the space. 
And speaking of space, space and space travel, science fiction has often featured the whole body freezing of humans to sustain them over long space flight durations. And so this is what I was talking about earlier with cryogenics, where according to my favourite book, cryogenics is the word for freezing whole people in hopes that they can be revived someday. But my favourite book was a little bit less optimistic. No matter how carefully they were frozen, almost every part of them will be damaged by ice or cryoprotectants. Even if they do wake up, they will need repairs to almost every body part. But while my favourite book ended negatively, I thought it would be better to end positively, as there are different companies in this space that are looking to develop the technology further and make cryogenics a viable option for different patients for humans and pets. Firstly, there is Alcor, a company that's been going for over 50 years, and they have lots of information on their website about it. Then there's a more recent company, Tomorrow Biostasis, which, similarly to Alcor, are offering a complete cryogenic service. But here they also have two companion organisations, one being the European Biostasis Foundation, a Swiss non-profit foundation dedicated to furthering biostasis by conducting scientific research. And because I have a pet, I have to mention CryoPets, another recent startup that is developing whole body cryopreservation for pets that down the line may pivot to do the same with humans. And so to provide a more optimistic quote now, whatever the route taken, whether through better comprehension of basic phenomena or an exploitation of nature's empiricism, most of cryobiology's real achievements lie ahead. However, as always in research, though frequently forgotten, the most important tools to this end will not be just new sophisticated techniques and instruments, but a determination to aggressively maintain an open mind, to avoid the tunnel vision of a favourite hypothesis, and to enjoy, as a consequence, the vital capacity to stay in motion. So cryobiology is definitely a multidisciplinary topic, requiring an understanding of biology, chemistry for the deployment and production of cryoprotectants, physics for understanding the energetics of ice crystallisation and controlling ice growth, and engineering to material sciences. But what are people's actual opinions on cryopreservation? Well, around 20% of people in the study showed interest in signing up for cryopreservation. A much smaller fraction decided to be cryopreserved, around 6%. Moreover, many respondents, around 42%, were pessimistic regarding the likelihood of cryopreservation being successful, with the mean estimate of time until revival of cryopreserved bodies would be possible was 82 years. But given what I've told you, one question remains. Would you want to be cryopreserved? So, on that bombshell, I hope you've learned something in this pretty intensive introduction to cryobiology. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, and thank you for listening.